Hiya. So we're on to the finale, the final two chapters of our book Skellig. I've got a bit of a cold coming for some reason, probably because it's the end of term. And that often happens to teachers and children sometimes. You get to the holidays and you get poorly. So I'm sorry if I sound completely bunged up when I'm reading. Anyway, the vipers from last time around, I asked, can you recall three moves that Michael used when playing football back in school? He was pretty phenomenal, wasn't he? He was using swerves, dribbles, flicks, skipping over tackles, back heeling the ball, diving headers, long shots curled into the net. And can you explain what the three white feathers left by Skellig symbolised? Michael pointed out that one of the feathers was for the baby as well, so you can infer that Skellig meant the three feathers to symbolise the three children, Michael, Mina and the baby. Finally, a vocabulary question. What other phrase could Mina have used to describe the owls when she said beautiful, tender savages? You could perhaps say caring, sorry, gorgeous, caring beasts. I used synonyms for each of those words in turn. Beautiful, so gorgeous, tender, caring, savages, beasts. And I like the fact that these two words have been put together, tender and savages, because there's a contrast between tender and savage. How can they be both? What's going on with my punctuation? Oh dear. There we go. How can they be both? The vipers for this time around. How are... Oh, I forgot to change the chapter numbers right there. Um, what are we on? 40... Five and forty-six. Why do you think that Mum caught her breath when she saw Mina's drawing? And can you predict um, what the prequel? So David Almond has written a prequel to Skellig, and what do you think it's about? So what does prequel mean? Prequel means a. Um, let me just turn the sound off there. Prequel means a book that comes before the book that you've just read. So the prequel is, of course, before Skellig. Sorry, I'm stumbling over my words because I've got messages coming in, which I'm needing to switch off from. Anyway, that final summarising question. Can you summarise for someone else the whole book without any spoilers? And can you be so persuasive that you get them to read, want to read the book too? They're welcome to listen to the to these clips, of course, or get hold of a copy for themselves. Okay, <clears throat> chapter 45. The Saturday, that Saturday, the builders came to sort the garage out. There were three of them, an old man in a cap, Mr Batley, and his two sons, Nick and Gus. They thumped the walls and watched them sway and tremble. They heard the roof creaking and sagging. They scratched the bricks and watched them flake easily away. They yanked Dad's planks off and peered inside. Mr Batley took his cap off and scratched his bald head. Wouldn't get me in there for danger money, he said. He pondered. He shrugged and twisted his mouth and looked at Dad. Know what I'm going to say, don't you? he said. Suppose so, said Dad. Now what else for it? Knock it down and start again. Dad looked at me. What do you think, he said. Don't know, I said. Easy choice, said Mr Batley. Knock it down or sit and watch it fall down. Dad laughed. Go on then, he said. Get the stuff out from inside and knock it down. They put steel props up to keep the roof from falling in while they worked inside. They brought the junk out and laid it around Ernie's toilet in the wilderness. All the ancient chest of drawers, the broken wash basins, the bags of cement, the broken doors, the tattered deck chairs, rotted carpets, the ropes, the pipes, the newspapers and magazines, the coils of cable, the bags of nails. Dad and I went through it all as they brought it out. We kept saying, this will come in useful, then saying, no it won't, it's just a piece of junk. A truck came and left a huge steel skip in the back lane. We chucked in everything. We were all covered in dead blue bottles, dead spiders, bricks and mortar dust. When it was empty, we stood around drinking tea and laughing at the mess. I went to the door alone and stared in. Michael, said Dad. Yes, I said, I know, I won't go in. He told the builders 
about how desperate I'd been to get in there after we'd moved in. Just like these two used to be, said Mr. Batley. Show them something dark and dangerous and it, and it was the devil's own work to keep them out. I kept on staring, just rubble and dust and broken pottery, and in the far corner a couple of takeaway trays, some brown ale bottles, a scattered handful of feathers, the pellets. I sighed and whispered, goodbye, Skellig. Then the builders and dad were at my back. See? said Mr. Batley, pointing past me. Looks like you're, you've had a dosser spending a night or two in there. Lucky the whole lot didn't come down on his head. Then we finished the tea. Mr. Batley rubbed his hands. Right then, lads, he said. Time for a bit of knocky down. It only took an hour or two. We stood in the kitchen and watched them work with crowbars and sledgehammers and saws. We bit our lips and shook our heads each time a bit of roof or a bit of wall fell with a massive thump. Soon the garage was just a pile of dust, of bricks and timber and dust. Bloody hell, said Dad. Least we'll have a nice long garden for the baby to play in, I said. He nodded and started talking about the lawn he'd lay and the pond he'd dig and the shrubs he'd plant for the birds to build their nests in. Ha, he said, a little paradise for us all. When it was over, Gus and Nick stood proud and happy with their hands on their hips Mr. Batley, white as death with dust, gave us the thumbs up and we went out with more tea. Oh, bloody lovely that was, he said. Aye, said Gus, you can't beat a bit of knocky down. <laughs> they're called builders, but they're actually knocking things down rather than building things up. Chapter 46. She came home on a Sunday, a beautiful, bright, warm day. It was really spring at last. Dad went off in the car and I stayed behind to finish cleaning the kitchen up. I wrapped last night's takeaway tins in newspaper and threw them in the bin. I put the kettle on for Mum. I got a can of beer and a glass ready for Dad. I went upstairs and slipped the baby's feather under her mattress. I smiled, because I knew she'd have the best of dreams. I waited, looked out into the empty space left by Mr Batley and his sons. Even the cracked concrete floor was gone now. There was a wooden fence instead of the back wall. I imagined the garden filled with all the shrubs and flowers and the grass that would soon be growing where the wilderness had been. I trembled when I heard the car. I couldn't move. Then I took deep breaths and thought of Skellig and went to open the front door. Dad had the baby in his arms. Mum was stood there, beaming. Welcome home, Mum. I whispered, using the words I'd practised. She smiled at how nervous I was. She shook my hand and led me back into the house, into the kitchen. She sat me on a chair and put the baby in my arms. Look how beautiful your sister is, she said. Look how strong she is. I lifted the baby higher. She arched her back as if she was about to dance or fly. She reached out and scratched with her tiny nails at the skin on my face. She tugged at my lips and touched my tongue. She tasted of milk and salt and of something mysterious, sweet and sour, all at once. She whimpered and gurgled. I held her closer and her dark eyes looked right into me, right into the place where all my dreams were, and she smiled. She'll have to keep going for checkups, Mum said, but they're sure the danger's gone, Michael. Your sister is really going to be all right. We laid the baby on the table and sat around her. We didn't know what to say. Mum drank her tea. Dad let me have swigs of his beer. We just sat there looking at each other and touching each other and we laughed and laughed and we cried and cried. Soon there was a gentle knock at the door. I went and found Mina standing there. She was shy and quiet, like I'd never seen her before. She started to say something, but it was a mumble and she ended up just looking into my eyes. Come and see, I said. I took her hand and led her into the kitchen. She said good evening politely to my parents. She said she hoped they didn't mind. Dad shifted aside to let her sit beside the table. She looked down at the baby. She's beautiful, she gasped. She's extraordinary. And she looked around and laughed with us all. She was really shy again when she said, I brought a present, I hope you don't mind. She unrolled a picture of Skellig with his wings rising from his back and a tender smile on his white face. Mum caught her breath. 
She stared at me and she stared at Mina. For a moment I thought she was going to ask us something. Then she simply smiled at both of us. Just something I made up, said Mina. I thought the baby might like it on her wall. It's really lovely, Mina, Mum said, and she took it gently from Mina's hands. Thank you, said Mina. She stood there awkwardly. I'll leave you alone now. I led her back to the door. We smiled at each other. See you tomorrow, Mina. See you tomorrow, Michael. I watched her walk away in the late light. From across the street, Whisper came to join her. Then, uh, when Mina stooped down to stroke the cat, I was sure I saw for a second the ghostly image of her wings. <laughs> back in the kitchen, they were talking again about giving the baby a proper name. Persephone, I said. Not that mouthful again, said Dad. We thought a little longer, and in the end, we simply called her Joy. <laughs> How about that? What a story. There's the author, David Armand. So, on the basis of that, if you've enjoyed it, you might want to pick up the prequel, which I can show you all. Oh, it's not listed in here because this book was published beforehand. Um, but I can tell you that the prequel is called I Am Mina. So if you've enjoyed that story, you might choose to take uh, find a copy of I Am Mina and yeah, have a read of that one. Anyway, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've really enjoyed reading that story and hearing back from those of you who've got in touch with your the answers to your Vipers questions and to, of course, find out that another class is listening along with us. It's been great and um, I hope you enjoy your summer. Um, I look forward to seeing you in September. Take care. Bye.